welcome to Extraordinary History. It's a momentous occasion, the first in a new series of history videos, um, Civil War Biographies. Now, the English Civil War had lots of interesting and important people, and the aim of this series is really to explore the political history of the English Civil War through the stories of these uh, individuals. Today we're going to begin by looking at John Hamden. John Hamden was a determined tax rebel who fought a very unpopular tax called ship money. So we'll be looking at John today and his lasting significance through the ages. Ship money, eh? A rather good opportunity for some boat puns. So, why begin with John Hamden? Well, Hamden's story is interesting, it's revealing, it says a lot about how Charles managed to alienate his subjects um, so much at the beginning of the 1640s. John was born around 1595 in Great Hamden in Buckinghamshire. He was born into a staunchly Cal Calvinist family. This is significant because in this period, family and politics were very deeply intertwined. His family were very well linked. They were linked with famous, um, a very staunch uh, Puritan family, such as the Cromwells um, and the Barrington family. For example, um, you're almost certainly aware of Hamden's cousin, a certain Oliver Cromwell. This really goes to show just how deeply embedded his family was in these important Puritan gentry networks at the time. Now, this all changed in uh, 1637, November, when King Charles I decided to bring a test case against John Hamden for his non-payment of a tax called ship money. What was ship money, and why did Hamden decide not to pay it? For this, we're going to need a bit of context. Now, Charles I had very fractious relationships with his parliament. Indeed, from 1629 to 1640, there's a period known as his personal rule, where he ruled without parliament entirely. No problem, right? Uh, Charles is king, he can do what he likes. Now, the problem with this is the parliament's sanction was required for the granting of extraordinary taxation. That is money given for maybe changing circumstances in government or a foreign policy issue. The problem was that military costs were spiraling, spiraling out of control during the 1630s, as were governmental costs, and Charles was desperately struggling to keep his governmental vessel afloat. Now, desperate times called for desperate measures, and to remedy this, the king employed some desperately shady measures in an attempt to keep the royal treasury going. My personal favourite of these dodgy expedients has to be forest law. The audacity of the scheme, if nothing else. Charles and his ministers decided that the boundaries of the royal forests were going to change. Small thing change, you might think. We're rolling the clock back 300 years, so now the royal forests, they're not where the forests actually are now. They're defined now as all that was royal forests during the rule of Edward I. Now... This has some consequences. If you're living in a town that happens to, you know, be where there happened to be a royal forest 300 years ago, well, guess what? You've got to stump up some cash. Pretty desperate ploy as a means of making money. You could say it was the kind of tax that Charles could not see faring well. Another dodgy expedient was the force loan of 1627. This Effectively, it was just Charles arbitrarily demanding his wealthy subjects give him money. It's called a loan, but the chances of repayment were pretty unlikely. Hamden himself was actually in prison for his opposition to this loan. Just think about this forced loan for a second. Put it in a modern setting, a government just asks the wealthiest people in the country to pay up a lump sum. It could be quite popular. And you know, we'd probably call it socialism. Um, Starting a new historical theory here, Charles Guevara, communist hero. Let me know what you think about that one. By far the most widely opposed of Charles' expedients, however, was the tax ship money. Now, ship money was not completely out of the blue. Uh, Plantagenet rulers had levied this tax ship money on coastal towns before. Effectively what it was, was the commution of a boat. So these coastal towns are meant to furnish naval ships, 
sometimes the Crown would accept a monetary payment. Obviously, the line between conscription and taxation here is fairly blurred. Charles, however, decided to levy this tax on not just coastal towns, but inland counties as well, on a yearly basis. This proved to be extremely unpopular, and coupled with the fact that the, with the, fact that the tax um, affected a much poorer section of the population than some of his other innovations, it quickly proved to be extremely unpopular. Um, the fuzzy line between conscription and taxation looked really here to clearly pass into the camp of taxation, and this was a clear breach of parliamentary privilege. So why would Charles bring a test case against a relatively unknown figure on a national level, uh, John Hamden? His choice of Hamden seems to actually be a conscious and slightly malevolent uh, decision on the part of Charles, because John Hamden's uncle, Sir Edmund Hamden, actually died of imprisonment after his own imprisonment for not paying the forced loan of 1627. You suspect the king was angling for an easy victory. Unfortunately for him, he had reeled in a particularly stubborn fish in John Hamden. So ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for the results of the case? Surely a stunning victory for John Hamden to stick it to the man, right? Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. No, in fact, on the 12th of June 1938, the judges convened. Seven voted for the king, five for Hamden. Now, it seems like a loss for Hamden, but when you consider that the judges are entirely dependent, uh, their positions are entirely dependent on the king, it's pretty significant that five were prepared to stick their neck out and say, no, you know what, I think ship money is an illegal tax with no parliamentary sanction. And that's exactly how contemporaries viewed it. This tax really put a dent in Charles's moral authority to collect ship money. John and his lawyer, um, Oliver Sinjin, made a determined stand against ship money. And the case aroused enormous popular appeal, um, popular interest at the time. One diarist by the name of Thomas Knevitt, don't know about the pronunciation on that one, so make your own mind up, Thomas Knevitt, uh, he, he wanted to go into the courtroom to see the trial. He said he was up at the peep of the day, but he could not even get two to three in, within two to three yards of the door. Um, so that shows you the interest that there was at the time in the trial. The results of the way his case combined with a 20% food price hike and a reluctance on the part of the government to pay non pursuers. The net result of this was that the actual revenues from ship money dropped dramatically. In, in 1639, less than 20% of projected revenue was actually collected. Um, this was really a very significant factor in Charles losing the good goodwill of his populace, his subjects. Hamden went on to serve in the short and long parliament of the 1640s. Uh, he was a strong advocate of the parliamentarian cause and became a very popular figure among the parliamentarian ranks. He's significant for being one of the first to think of to um, promote the Scottish alliance, um, a vital alliance between Scotland, uh, Scottish Covenanteers, and many an English parliamentarian faction which was to play no small role in the eventual victory of Parliament in the English Civil War. Um, he was a prickly character and one that Charles certainly feared. This is underlined by one event more than any other, which was Charles' attempt in 1642 to arrest five members of Parliament for treason. Hamden's name was, a, was one amongst one of those five. Hamden was mortally wounded um, in 1643 at the Battle of Chalgrove Field uh, by a musket shot. He retreated to the market town of Tame, where he died six days later. You could say that John's zeal for the parliamentarian cause was only tamed at Tame. Thought I couldn't sloop any lower, right? Sloop any lower. So what is Hamden's legacy? It would be easy to see him as a dissident. Um, he protested against ship money. He saw it as a means to undermining Charles's personal rule, a regime that he had m many reasons to loathe personally. I think, however, that the emphasis is misplaced in this reading. Um, Hamden simply saw ship money as an illegal tax, and he resented 
that anyone should have to pay it. It was Parliament's privilege to grant extraordinary taxation, and I believe that John Hampton stood up for the principle rather than standing up for regime change. For Hampden, taxation was a cherished principle. Um, ship money was an illegal tax, and for God and his countrymen, he was morally obliged to repudiate it. So why does Hampden matter? Why does he matter now? For me, what's really interesting about John Hampden is his legacy. Many have talked about his legacy. Um, in his time, he was a hard-working figure, he was a shrewd figure, but he was not a genius. He was not particularly remarkable when you consider the exploits of his contemporaries, such as maybe Cromwell, John Pym. Yet we continue to talk about him and revere him. I think his legacy rests in this. With diligence, elegance and dignity, he changed the world that he lived in, and the results of his actions still continue to shape the world that we live in. Let me give you a concrete example. The Scottish National Football Stadium, Hamden Park, named after our very own John Hamden. So, I hope you enjoyed John Hamden and our debut episode of Extraordinary History. Be sure to tune in next time in two weeks as we take a look at another interesting figure from the uh, British Civil Wars, a man named William Prynne. Uh, he's a radical five-round preacher, and he doesn't have any ears. Yeah, you heard right. If you want to find out more, tune in two weeks' time. See you next time, and remember to play hard and learn harder.